All right, everyone, we're very excited today. We're having another session with Ward, which we will record in two parts. This first part is the straight through reading. And then we will do a discussion after that. It'll be a second recording. So I'm going to turn it over to Ward and he can set us up for what we're going to hear. And then Melissa will read. Jay Baba. Jay Baba. Are you seeing the uh, screen? No. Oh, wait, I have to hit this. Now? There you go. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Now let me see if I can get this for it comes back. Uh, <clears throat> for me. Hmm. No, that's not the one I want. Okay, are you seeing the one, the seven uh, suns? Yes. All right. I'm just trying to want to be able to see. Anyway, um, uh, so this is continuing the same topic that got broached uh, last time. We had this uh, looking, scrolling back last time. Ibaba started to introduce the world, the sun and the moon and the straight and the round and uh, this, this figure which shows um, the glyc globe and the sun and the world, the whole principle of that was explained. And then Baba briefly introduced these three planets with their seven suns. So this time Baba is going to really develop on that more. So I'm just going to scroll through these <coughs> lectures so you can see what's coming. Uh, this principle of reflection is going to be explained there. And then the next lecture, he's going to talk about the seven suns. And uh, then the different ranges of planets. We had some of that earlier, but now he's going to come back to it more fully. And the three planets and the uh, correlative proportions of intelligence and heart in each one. And if we get to this one, then Baba shifts topics on the 18th of December. And he starts his major first presentation on the topic of evolution. Uh, and this figure illustrates the human form through the course of evolution. For this particular talk, uh, Baba brought in all the Mandali uh, and had them attend it too, which he hadn't usually been doing. So here is, oh, you know, I have to get this working properly. I'm sorry. Okay. Right. Melissa. The Seven Sons, The What and the Why, a continuation from yesterday. Now, think and consider. These three linked worlds we have been speaking of, see planets A, B, and C in figure 8 on page 125, are actually one, comprising a single world. All the other worlds apart from these three are separate, alag, and accordingly, each has one sun only. But the three worlds, A, B, and C in figures 20 and 22, though they are three, yet at the same time they are one, as we have been saying. The third of them, C, has four sons. The second, B, has two sons. And the first, A, has one son only. Why? Let us look into the matter. A, B, and C are linked together. And really speaking, all three of them draw on a single source of light. The reason is this. The light globe that casts its light into the pokol, the hollowness, is single, and it provides for all three. In other words, the three suns, though separate, are linked to each other and derive their light from a single light globe. To illustrate how this happens, take the analogy of a lantern. 
Suppose that the flame of this lighted lantern represents a light globe. Then take three mirrors, each representing a shadow. The reflection of the light of the flame is a mirror, in a mirror is a sun. The symbols and their meanings then are these. Okay, maybe just read that little bit and then we can look at the figure. A flame equals a light globe. Mirrors equal worlds. A, a reflection equals a sun. Let's take a look at this. <clears throat> uh, now, Baba actually did this in front of the boys. He uh, brought a lantern and had two mirrors and had them come up and file past to illustrate what he's talking about. Oops, sorry, going back to it. So let's read the, so you see the three, this uh, first top left here, the uh, lantern with a single mirror is uh, projecting a single reflection. This one is meant to illustrate the principle that if the two mirrors are uh, you know, parallel to each other. You can't do that completely in a figure. So we just got close to it. You get um, in, back and forth innumerable times. Whereas if it's at a certain angle, it creates four reflections. Uh, so that's what Baba wanted to show. So why don't we read this key where this is explained? Key to figure 21. To demonstrate concretely and visually the principle of mirroring that makes it possible for a single light globe to create an appearance of multiple suns, Baba placed a lantern between two mirrors and adjusted their angles so as to produce different numbers of reflections. Figure 21 illustrates what Baba demonstrated before the boys. The left-hand panel shows the lantern reflected once in a single mirror. So let me show you that. That's that left one there, right? A single mirror. Okay. In the right-hand panel, two mirrors facing each other reflect the lantern back and forth innumerably. Okay, so that's this one, right? You see just many, many reflections. Okay. Just looking for where innumerably I found it. Yeah. <clears throat> In the bottom panel, two mirrors at right angles create four reflections of the lantern. So that's this bottom one down here. So he showed this, he's in the process of showing this to the boys. Baba's okay. demonstration was meant to illustrate the principle of reflection itself and how the angle of the mirrors affects the number of reflections. Readers should exercise caution in correlating figures 21 and 22, since these two figures are expressing related but different ideas and do not altogether match each other, particularly in the right-hand panel in figure 21 and world B in figure 22. Although the source manuscripts, after describing the demonstration with the lantern and mirrors, allude specifically to a figure and reserve a blank space for one, no diagram or illustration has anywhere been drawn in. Figure 21 has accordingly been conceived and drawn by the artist editor team as a pictorial representation of what the lecture describes in words. <clears throat> okay, and now we're back to the bottom of the page there. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, within the lantern, there is only a single flame. If one mirror is placed in front of this flame, the reflection within it will be single. 
But if two mirrors are placed opposite and facing each other, the reflections in both mirrors will be innumerable. But then again, if the two mirrors are placed at right angles to each other, four reflections will result, two in each mirror. This has been represented in figure 21. How does this bring us to a total of seven suns? At this juncture, Sri asked all the boys to come to this conclusion themselves by placing the mirrors at the specified angles with one single light source throwing its light on all of them and taking note and count of the reflections thus projected according to the laws of reflection. So that's the end of that lecture. That'd be a good thing to do at a seminar, wouldn't it? Yeah, you have a lantern. <laughs> and two mirrors, yeah. And two mirrors. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sam, would you read next, please? And this one is going to be continuing on the same thing. We're going to get a, a detailed explanation of how seven suns are produced. More on the seven suns. How are they created? What we have to prove today concerns the creation and origination of the seven suns. For the three worlds, A, B, and C, that we discussed yesterday. World A, as we saw, has one sun. World B has two suns. And world C has four. How does this come about? If two mirrors are placed opposite each other with a light at the center, innumerable reflections result. But if these two mirrors are placed at right angles, one sees four reflections of that light or anything else placed in that middle position. All this was demonstrated and proven yesterday. Then to proceed, Keep clearly in mind what is depicted in figure 22 on the next page. Remembering that the word image in that diagram with reference to the suns means only a round line. Now consider the light globe at the top of the picture figure, which throws light on the whole surface of the pokal or emptiness Worlds A, B, and C are the three shadows of this light, ranged one below the other, as will be explained further and illustrated in figure 23 below. Let's take a quick look at figure 22. So you see the light globe here, right? And we saw earlier um, with this figure, if you remember this one, um, oops, how, uh, yeah, how the light globe has a shadow, right? And the shadow casts its image into the pokal. The light from the light globe falls on that reflection and is reflected back to the world, if you guys remember that from last time. So this is the same principle. So these are the three shadows uh, comprising three worlds that are all really somehow or another one world. So that's what Baba here is talking about. We can look at that figure more in a minute. Okay, in figure 23 below, yeah. Oh, yeah, below. Um, get back to where I was. Yeah. <clears throat> Last paragraph, fourth line. Now consider the light globe at the top of the figure, which throws light on the whole surface of the pokal or emptiness. Worlds A, B, and C 
are the three shadows of this light, ranged one below the other, as will be explained further and illustrated in figure 23 below. These three worlds cast three images, which we will call A. A, pr a prime, B prime, and C prime. prime. B pr a prime, B prime, and C prime. Light from the light globe falls on these images and it is reflected by them back upon their namesake worlds. That is, A prime reflects its light on world A and B prime and C prime do likewise with respect to worlds B and C. Now let us examine each of these one at a time. Okay. And, uh, okay, should we read? Let's read a little more and then come back to the figure. <clears throat> the light globe throws its light on image A prime, the image of the A world. And this same light is reflected from image A prime back upon world A. Thus A prime becomes the sun for world A, which illumined by the light of its image A prime becomes itself a reflector of this same light, a function which world A serves over and above its essential nature as a shadow of the light globe. In this way, world A acquires one single sun. Yeah, let's so, keep going. I know this is really hard to follow, but when we look at the figure, it will make more sense. So let us proceed further. The light from the light globe is once again thrown as it was upon A prime, upon the image of world B, that is upon B prime. And this image B prime reflects this light back upon world B. And thus B prime becomes a sun for world B. But what happens over and above this? As explained above, world A, as the recipient of the light from its own sun or image, A prime, is itself illumined. And it acquires the property of reflecting light in its own right. And image B prime, receives this light reflected from world A. You know, Ward, let me interrupt for a second. Mm. I think it might be useful if we read the, the previous paragraph, look at the image, and then come back and read the <laughs> second paragraph. This is yeah, no, let, let's finish this and then go okay. back to the figure, I think, because the key will explain this also. Okay. I know this is this is hard to follow. <laughs> yeah, it's hard when to we look at the figure. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Okay, I That's think it. I'm here. Mm -hmm. In this way, image B prime receives light from two sources. The first directly from the light globe, and the second reflected from world A. Thus, world B has two suns both in B prime, and it receives their two reflections into itself, that is B. Okay, and now, so this is the figure illustrating this. So you see how the light globe up here, you see my little arrow, is that showing? Yeah, we see it. Okay, so uh, the light globe sends light to A prime, a prime is the image of A, right? You remember that. 
image A is the shadow of the light globe. There's no direct light going to the shadow or else it would be annihilated. But its image gets reflected into space and light from the light globe illuminates that image. And that light then goes back to A prime. In this way, A prime becomes the sun for world A, which is the earth. So we've been over that before. We went over that last time. But then what happens with world B, here's world B, the second shadow, and world B casts its image into Pokal, and its image then gets illumined directly from the light globe, right? You see that arrow there? But what happens beyond that is light from planet A is also cast onto B prime. You see that there? So thus, it has two sources of light, both the light globe and planet A, which has been illuminated uh, by its sun. And thus, you have two images of suns within B prime, right? I hope you guys are following that because it gets light from the light globe and it gets light from planet A also. And that creates the figure of two suns. And these two suns then through these green arrows uh, shine their light upon world B and people on world B see those two suns. Now where Baba is going to go from here is to see showing how you get four suns. And it's the same basic principle. Again, the light globe directly shines its light upon this image. C prime is the image of C, right? The image of this shadow cast upon Pokal, the emptiness. So it receives the light from the light globe. It also receives the light from planet A, and it receives the image of two suns coming from planet B. So it winds up having four suns, and those shine their light upon planet C. Yesterday, in our talk we went over last time, Baba said that these suns for B and C are much weaker and smaller than the original, and they're so close together that they almost seem to merge. Um, Maybe we could read this key, which it takes a while getting used to these ideas. I mean, clearly Baba is not talking about our physical solar system, obviously, you know. Um, there's something else going on here. You want key to try read this? Yeah. Sure. Key to figure 22. This extraordinary diagram shows how a single light globe produces seven suns for the three worlds, A, B, and C. In fact, A, B, and C are parts of a single world. The seventh world within the seventh range, as is explained later in this lecture and depicted in figure 23. As already noted, the three worlds which are shadows of the light globe, cast their images into space, Akash or Pokal. And those images end up reflecting in A prime, B prime, and C prime, which become the seven suns. These three reflecting images within A prime B prime and C prime get illuminated and wind up producing seven suns through the following process. Light from the light globe illuminates the image in A prime, which becomes the sun for world A. Okay, so that's this, right? That's uh, the light globe is illuminating the image in A prime, and that's the sun for world A. Okay, we're in this third line here, yeah. <laughs> um, which becomes the sun for world A. Light from the light globe, along with light reflected directly from world A, 
falls in B prime. And these two light sources create within B prime two suns, which shine their light back on world B. Okay, so that's, here's world B, right? And uh, its image is B prime, its image cast in Bokal is B prime. And that image receives light from the light globe and it also receives light from planet A. So that produces the appearance of two suns. Okay. So finally. Finally, light from three sources falls in C prime. These three sources include the light globe, the sunlight from A prime, reflected in the wor in world A, and the two suns in B prime, as reflected from world B. In this way, world C receives from C prime, the light of four suns. Right, so you guys see all of that. So here's the light from the light globe coming directly to the image C prime, it's the image of the world C, and uh, the light from A, uh, planet A, um, is also falling on that image and creating the appearance of a sun. And the two suns, uh, which have sh been shining on B, B reflects their images to create the appearance of two suns in C prime here. Thus C prime has a sun from the light globe, a sun from planet A, and two suns from planet B. And this light all shines back on C prime and becomes four suns. Uh, that's why Baba um, did this thing uh, with the lanterns, right? He's showing how you get the re four reflections if you have the uh, mirrors placed at uh, right angles to each other. Okay. None. Hmm. None of the manuscript source diagrams includes lines representing the reflection of the light of the four suns from C prime to C. But they have been drawn in here since the logic of the diagram clearly requires this. That's just talking here. There's no lights from the image back to planet C, but obviously it's needed. So we have several source diagrams like uh, this one here. I mean, this is kind of wild and crazy, isn't it? <laughs> In fact, um, in the Don Chanji's diary on this day, it said Baba gave this explanation and put in parentheses, a puzzle. <laughs> and um, Baba also uh, said that to explain this topic fully would take months. Okay. Is that... Um, so we yes. had gotten... What do you uh, think, Cassandra? How are we yeah, doing on this? We're going to have uh, Diana re pick up from here. Okay. Hey, okay, Diana. And now this is the, we only got through planet B in this reading, and now we're coming to planet C with its four suns. Yeah. Now let us turn to world C and its image C prime. This image C prime receives first of all the direct light from the light globe. And this light it casts, reflects, back on world C. So this is the first stream of light received by C prime. Just as we have seen above that world A, illumined by its own sun A prime, exhibits the property of reflecting that same light, which fell upon B prime, and B prime in turn reflected this light, which it received from A, in like manner, world A reflects its light into image C prime, 
which is the sun of the sea world. So this constitutes an additional source of light received by C prime over and above the direct light that it receives from the light globe, making for two sources of light for C prime. But this is not the end of the story. Something still has been left out. And what is it? A little thinking at once gives us the answer. Just as C prime, the image of C, receives the light from world A, similarly, it receives the reflections of light from world B. And these reflections are twofold corresponding to the two streams of light that it received from its own image B prime, as explained above. So then these two reflections from world B, which world C receives in addition to what it has received before, make up the complete tally of the sources of light that it receives to a total of four. That is, one from the light globe direct, one borrowed from A, and two borrowed from B. Thus, world C has four suns. To sum up, world A has one sun, world B has two suns, world C has four suns, that is, Worlds A, B, and C have, in their combined total, seven suns. Proven. Now, it must always be remembered that originally these three worlds had only three suns, A prime, B prime, and C prime. These three were the direct recipients of light from the light globe. Yet through the process as described above, these three were made to appear a seven. It must be borne in mind that the real source of all these suns, real and apparent, that is, the three original suns and the four reflections, always is and remains one and singular that is the light globe. Okay. So that's, now he's going to move on to another aspect of, of the, this mystical astronomy, that is the seven ranges of planets, which we had earlier. He's coming back to that now. The evolution of the worlds. In an earlier talk, we said that there are seven worlds as represented in figure 23, and all of them are inhabited. Should I read the footnote here? Um, uh, yeah, we can just skip it. It okay. just says that we're going back to the topic that he brought up on an okay. uh, earlier lecture. Consider the worlds one through seven, D through J in the diagram. Okay, let's take a glance at this. You've seen this sort of thing before. Um, so here you have, again, Paramatma. Everything is coming out of Paramatma. And you have the creator point. And then there are these seven ranges of planets. Uh, you may recall one has just stone. Two has stone and wind and stone and wind and water and um, these different things. Six has all forms up to animal form. And the seventh range has human form. He gave that to us. We're going to get that again. And these three planets at the head of the seventh range, A, B, and C, are the ones he was just talking about with the seven suns and all that stuff. So that's uh, uh, what he's referring to here. Okay. 
Evolution advances variously in these seven worlds, as detailed in our earlier explanations. That is, only stone can be found in the first world, stone and wind in the second, stone, wind, and metal in the third, and so on until the seventh world, where the full range of forms makes its appearance from stone to human beings. As to the realization of God, that can be achieved only in the seventh world. And within that world, only in sub-world A, which is a member of the three-world group A, B, and C, as was indicated in figure 8 on page 125, and as is depicted again as the top three circles marked A, B, and C, marked 7 in figure 23. Now, when it happens in the course of time that world A, in the seventh world range or projection, cools down, world A moves aside into the bokal and the world immediately below it, world B, takes its place. C moves into the position of B and the world below C rises up and fills the spot that C had occupied. How does all this transpire? Let us review the situation once again. In world A of the seventh range, innumerable evolutions take place from the beginning in atom form to the culmination of evolution as the human. The same evolutions occur in B also as in C. Now all three of these subworlds belong to the seventh greater world. So when these three shift in their, in their evolutionary sequence, what would take the place of the last of these C in the seventh group? Naturally, the sixth world would perform this function marked H in figure 23. In the sixth world, of course, evolution has advanced from atom to animal form. And what then fills the position of the sixth world, which has shifted and advanced into the seventh group? That we will discuss in due course. Now, to dilate upon the difference between these three subworlds, A, B, and C. In world C, the inhabitants are far more advanced than they are on B and A. But no love, no feelings arise there. Rather, intelligence, the culmination of instinct, has developed to the highest degree. The people of C do not even talk, for they are so advanced intellectually that they can speak with their minds directly and understand each other without using their mouths at all. Their intelligence is so great as to enable them to express their thoughts to each other directly without recourse to gross means, but their form is still the human form. Remember that. When world C rises to occupy the position of world B, this intelligence, which is really the maturation of instinct, diminishes and concurrently love and feelings make their appearance. And in A, intelligence or instinct diminishes further and love and feelings increase even more. The table on page 196 will give you a clearer idea of the progress or decline of intelligence, love, and feelings 
in these three worlds, A, B, and C. Let us take the figure of the rupee, comprised of 16 anas, which can be divided proportionately in table four. Okay, and so let's take a moment <clears throat> and uh, look again at this table. This is uh, what we think was the octopus table. <laughs> And so they referred to it. So you see, these are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, with uh, the different forms in the evolutionary sequence represented on each, the seventh including uh, encompassing human forms. A, B, and C here are the three planets, and here's a moon which used to be planet A, but cooled off and moved aside, and it is now a moon there. So this key explains that. A, B, and C, the three planets comprising the seventh world. D through J, down here, um, the seven ranges of planet, K and L, these here, hollowness or empty space, Pokal, M here is a moon. One through six, worlds within planetary ranges inhabited by subhuman forms. And seven is the seventh world with three subworlds inhabited by humans. And he, this is one of the source diagrams here. These are two of them, actually. Uh, this is diagram was uh, reproduced in many different places. So Diane, do you want to read the key? Yeah, I'm going to ask uh, Jim to pick up from here. I don't want to okay. wear anybody out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think you need to be a sea planet guy to follow this explanation. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> Super intelligence, yeah. Okay, key to figure 23. Having explained the complex interrelations among the three planets, A, B, and C, in the seventh world, Baba now returns to the topic of the seven worlds and seven planetary ranges, a subject which he introduced much earlier in his lecture of the 5th and 6th December, and illustrated in a simple form in figure 8. As explained in detail on page, pages 118 and 120, the first six wor worlds are inhabited by stone, wind, metal, water, vegetation, and animals. Only the seventh range hosts human beings. Emanating out of the Paramatma through the creator point, the seven planetary ranges of figure 23 are labeled D through J. Planets A, B, and C occupy the position in the central range G closest to the creator point. Baba's discussion of the worlds and waves and planetary ranges raises many questions. For an in-depth discussion, see Appendix 3, pages 498 to 509. Yeah, this, so people who want to go into this, I strongly urge, uh, take a look first at the, uh, that uh, appendix. Okay, and he just uh, referred to this. Um, you know, back in uh, those, the 20s, uh, the one rupee, an ana was a term used for a coin. Uh, there are 16 anas to the rupee. The rupee was worth something in those days. Um, so now Bob is using the illustration, uh, the ana to illustrate um, the proportionalities of feelings and intelligence on these three planets. Jim, are you able to yeah. read this out? Um, to, to read what's on the diagram? You could, yeah, you could actually read it okay. like a sentence. Yeah. It works okay. Okay, well, we have, uh, we have worlds, uh, C, B, and A. 
So mm-hmm. in world C, intelligence in an, is 16 honest. It's 100%. And love and feelings, then feelings of love are zero honest or 0%. In world B, if intelligence is 12 honest or 75%, then love and feelings are four honest or 25%. And in world A, if intelligence is eight honest or 50%, then feelings of love are eight honest or 50%. It is for this reason that Hafez says, the gate of truth. Um, why don't we ask uh, Farish Day to save us from ourselves? Okay. جناب عشق را درگاه بسی بالاتر از عقل است کسی آن آستان بوسد که جان در آستان آستین دارد wonderful and it is translated the gate of truth is much higher than the gate of intellect O you lover of truth only one who can keep his very life in his sleeve can kiss the highest, the higher state. And why don't we read this footnote, which gives a literal translation? Okay. Literally, the Persian couplet translates, the threshold of the gate of love is much higher than that of the intellect. Only one who has his life in his sleeve can kiss that threshold. The implication seems to be that one should be prepared to give away or surrender one's life at any instant. The text is quoted here as it appears in Usti, uh, Utsi. Kudsi, Kudsi. Oh, Kudsi, yeah. Hmm. All right. So that's where Faresh Day translated hmm. it from. So interesting. Yeah. Well, love is higher than intelligence. One who rises beyond intelligence wins love, and he who wins love realizes God. So now, all of you are eight honors of intelligence and eight honors of love. If 16 honors of love come to prevail in you, you will get God. Therefore, your love must increase to the proportion of 16 honors complete. How is this to happen? As we explained yesterday in the dining hall, love must be created. Indeed, the full 16 honors worth. Why don't we but, could read this note, yeah. Okay, yeah. Some of the details of Baba's talk in the dining hall on the previous night are related on page 43. There, Baba emphasizes that love should be created without strain. He also related the anecdote of the doll that he himself used to, used to cherish in his early childhood, as is referenced in the next day's lecture. That's a little fascinating autobiographical detail we got from Baba, that he had this doll when he was a kid. Wow. Uh, let's see. But this must be accomplished with a feeling of ease and pleasure in a joyous mood, cheerfully, and not in a grave and gloomy mood which swings of temperament. Remember the analogy of the baby's doll that was given to you yesterday? And remember, too, the insect, the moth, that goes mad in desire for the light of the flame to the point where eventually it is consumed and dies in it. Okay, that's the end of that lecture. Mm, very good. Wow. Maybe we should stop there. We spent a full hour on those two. Yeah, that second one was a little rough. So maybe, well, how is yeah. the next one? How is the next one? Is it? Is it's it... a major lecture in its own oh, okay. right. Let's wait then. All right, on we evolution, need a moment yeah. here to stop the recording, mm -hmm. and then we will open it up for questions and comments. <laughs>